Welcome to the Find Creative Expression Podcast, conversations about art and creativity. I'm your host, Sarah Crawford, author, musician, and playwright. You can find the show notes and other information at findcreativeexpression.com. And let's get going. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode five of the Find Creative Expression podcast. Coming up later, I have an interview with songwriter, author, and speaker, Brian Perry. Brian Perry is such an inspiration to me. So it was really great to talk to him. I'm not going to go on for very long in this little segment before the interview because we did talk um, a little longer than interviews I usually do, but it was really great to talk to him. Um, I've kind of been having my own struggles lately with just some stress at my day job and, you know, some depression issues. And I I haven't been writing, really. I mean, I tried to write for a little bit last night. It didn't go very well. So I really needed, you know, to be inspired. And I, I really needed to hear um, some of the things that, that Brian was saying. So... I hope uh, you guys will also be inspired. All right, so let's just go ahead and get right into it. Uh, Hey, everybody. I am here today with Brian Perry. Uh, Brian Perry is a singer, songwriter, author, speaker, coach, and that guy who writes on his car. Helping people live in their most empowered and joyful experience of their life. Brian leans on each of his crafts to offer a path forward with poetic clarity and humor. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here, Sarah. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks for, you know, thanks for coming on the Find Creative Expression podcast. Um, I'm digging it. I've been listening. It's, it's, uh, it's cool. I'm, I'm, I've been getting a lot out of it. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So when did you start writing songs and how did you fall in love with songwriting? Uh, how would I, I fell in love immediately is, is how. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started writing songs when I was uh, 20 years old um, and I had gotten a guitar not long before that uh, and stumbled upon a song essentially I, I i i remember actually when i first i was driving in my then girlfriend's car with my musical partner as well down in new orleans and uh, i was in the back seat and the two of them were up front because i was too nervous to have be in the same seat even in the same row <laughs> in the <laughs> car and i said i think i wrote a song and, <laughs> and uh i shared the, the shared sang it through for them and and they were like yeah it's a song you know and uh, <laughs> uh but i just i mean ever since then i was just hooked i was hooked it was for me an immediate um way of organizing my thoughts and emotions and understanding and processing my life which was yeah. something that i otherwise um have can struggle with so yeah. yeah, yeah, I I hear that. I, I feel like uh, every kind of artist probably struggles with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's it, it tends to be a, a way a lot of us, at least most of the artists that I meet, we it's kind of how we enter the world. Oh yeah, yeah. completely. Um, yeah. As that's often how I how I say that is is it doesn't matter to me. Sort of fundamentally, doesn't matter to me whether the world sees me as a songwriter on somewhat level it's just simply how i understand the world it's it's the lens through which i see it right um, right there was do you remember the show the newsroom uh yeah yeah uh, jeff daniels was was one of the stars in that and there's he he plays this news anchor who's who uh he's also a guitar player and one there's an amazing scene where he says uh uh, somebody, somebody says, "Oh, I forgot that you play guitar on the side." And he says, "No, I'm a newsman on the side." Um, <laughs> you know, that, I like that. That's sort of the role, but but that's why I, I just fell in love with it immediately because it just, I mean, I remember my very first time that I was on stage, and to be clear, I was terrible. 
Um, but I, but I remember getting <laughs> off stage and, and my girlfriend asking me what, you know, what did you think? And I said, uh, it felt like going home. Um, and, uh, and, and at the time I was somebody who really didn't, I had moved around a lot growing up and I just didn't feel like I had a home. And I remember that very first open mic, just being like, oh my God, you can just bring the lights down right now. I'm good. This is, this is where I want to live. <laughs> Aw, that's awesome. Yeah. So you have six full length albums available and your songs are incredibly honest and emotional. So what is your song writing process like? Thank you. Um, I, I, uh, and I should say that I have, I have like six, I was looking at, when I knew I was going to be doing this with you, I was looking through uh, my my iTunes library, and I have those six ones that are sort of the bar barcoded records, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then probably another half a dozen or more that I just bootstrapped and sold out of the back of my van, you know. Oh, great! Um, but uh, but I, uh, I I lost the thread of your question, being distracting myself. Oh yeah, there. no, I was just asking, uh, like, what is your songwriting process like? Um. It's, I, I'll bet you this is true for you too. It's evolved a lot over the years. Um, my, my favorite, I, I adore when the songs just come in a rush, mm -hmm. you know, when suddenly you're just in it and, and you have to write it. Um, but uh, very often for me right now, the process it involves a couple of things. One, it, it can involve just creating space and time for it. You know, um, you know, James Taylor said, don't let them take your wasted time. And, and it's, it's, it's about making sure that I have some time to just be with my guitar. Right. And, um, and, and for me, uh, uh, to, to share a little bit of a silliness, uh, for me of late, it's become really important for there to be darkness. I don't know why. I think it's a focus thing. I'm, I'm terribly ADD, as will no doubt be evident by the time we're done here. Um, I, but I, I so I, I like to wear, I, I'll put a hoodie on and I'll pull it down over my face so I'm not distracted. And I'll just play my guitar. And, and I'm listening. I'm listening for a story. Usually there's, there'll be something in the guitar that, that will hit me and, and, and then I'm literally talking to my guitar and often out loud going, all right, what are we talking about? What's the story you're trying to share with me? And I know that I'm on to something when I have an emotional reaction to it. Right. Right. You know, when I find something that causes me to cry or yell, or I, I've been blessed to do a little bit of writing up in Nashville. And I'm, I, I, one of the things that I've, consistently found to be funny up there is people be, you get into a writing room and be like, all right, so what are we doing today? Are we killing somebody? Are we making people cry, falling in love? What are we doing? <laughs> and, and I find that at that moment that I hit that, that I'm, that I have an emotional reaction to it. That's when I know I've found a story that wants to be told. Right. Um, and, um, and then it's a process of telling it. Um, and sometimes it's, it's the opposite. Sometimes it starts with a word. Sometimes it starts with a phrase. Um, I will say, that the thing that I find to be really consistent is it usually starts with a, a, a discomfort. Right. I, I used to misinterpret. I used, like I, suddenly I, I start, I feel kind of restless internally. And if I'm paying attention, that's usually a moment that it's time for me to pick up my guitar. Um, right. because something's trying to make its way out and it, it's just kind of scratching at the inside of my, my head going, yo, the reason you're restless right now is I got a story I need to tell and I'm going to give you the chance to tell it if you want, but if you wait around too long, I'm out, you know? <laughs> so it's creating space to be with the guitar and let the story present itself and then see if I can do a decent job of telling it honestly. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. That's really cool. I, I I haven't written nearly as many songs as you have, but I found that, you know, my songwriting process, it's totally different with each song, <laughs> you know? Right. How is it different though, you think? What what what's what's it are there are there consistencies at all? 
I mean, I've I've had songs where they just kind of came to me like fully formed, and mm-hmm. I never really changed it that much from when I wrote it. And then I I have songs that I just like they kind of evolved over time. Yeah. Like I recently, you know, started playing music again, and I was listening to like an album that I did in 2009, and it was like some of these songs I hadn't even heard in years. And, and some of them, you know, I had been playing like live, you know, before, like before that. But then when I listened to them on the album, I was like, oh, I play this song totally differently now. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't even play this part anymore. Like, it, yeah, it was. Yeah, totally. It's interesting how that happens, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and the songs need to kind of have that room to grow and evolve. And and, and, I, and I, I wonder if you have this experience, too. For me, once I've. Once I feel like I've written a song, once I feel like, okay, that's a draft. There, mm-hmm. There's a you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, repeat, we're done. You know, it's it's once that's kind of fully fleshed out in however way it presents itself, then I have to let it sit for at least overnight. Right. And, and when you come back to it the next day, then you find out, okay, was that just an exercise in the joy of getting to create? Or is this a song that really says something and, and did I tell the truth in it? And because I me, mean, that's that's for me. That's always the measure. Whether I'm telling a story that's my own, or I'm narrating a character story, it has to be telling the truth as I can see it. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Totally. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's an evolving process for sure. Anyway. Yeah. Definitely. So your most recent album is After All from mm-hmm. 2019. Um, yeah. So what was the experience of recording that album like? Really, really, really fun for me. Um, I had, uh, so I, I, what, I, a couple of things happened. I, over the last several years, one of the challenges that I've run into is I, I had a couple of um, episodes of a, an illness called Bell's palsy, and um, it, which is a, a, a facial paralysis um and for some reason one of the residual effects of it for me in my life it seems to have affected the way my voice functions right um and the result of that is that you know those three four hour marathon gigs that a lot of us used to do a lot of um (laughs) uh for better or for worse i'm not able to do right now i can't i i end up kind of coughing and choking when I start trying to sing for any length of time, which has been really, really, frankly, brutal to my sense of who I am. Um, but also a really great opportunity to kind of um, process through my relationship with with who I am. And, uh, right. and as, much, as much as the songs are, the, the process of being able to create is is sort of church for me in many ways. Um, it can't be all that I am, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but anyway, in the midst of that, and just kind of frankly, uh, going through a few years of feeling sorry for myself in it, I finally just went, you know, my hero, some of my heroes are people like uh, Springsteen and Tom Waits and, and Leonard Cohen and people, these guys can't sing. I mean, they're terrible singers, but they're, <laughs> but they're geniuses, you know? Right, and, right. uh, and, and so I decided to kind of meet my voice where it is. And I had written, I I kind of looked down and realized I had written a number of songs over the last couple of years that I really, that meant something to me. Um, And there tends to be a moment when I go, okay, yeah, that's, that's it. This, this songs, albums tend to be a snapshot of who you are at a certain moment in your life. Um, Mm -hmm. And there comes a point when it's time to sort of uh, put that yearbook to bed, if you will. And and uh, in the songs just kind of seem to say where it's time. So the so the, I, that was a long long way of getting here. I <laughs> I wrote these songs up at a, a cabin in, in North Georgia that my I'm very blessed that my uh, extended family owns and I spend time up there whenever I can. And I decided, well, let's do this. Let's go ahead and since I can't count on when my voice is going to be working properly or not, I'm just going to set some recording equipment up here in the kitchen, literally on the spot where I wrote most of these songs. And we'll just record them. And, and uh, sometimes I would get through in the middle of an amazing take and have a coughing fit. And, and I'd just be like, okay, well, that's how that happened. Um, 
but it allowed me to have um, sort of more control over recording than I really have ever had. It it allowed me to be more raw and vulnerable um, and to just kind of get out of the way of the songs. Um, right. It's just me and my guitar in this room. And, oh, you'll love this. This is so fun. I, I had this problem because it wasn't a studio. And right. you know that when you're in a studio, it's all baffled and everything and you can't hear anything. Mm-hmm. When you're in a kitchen, it's different. And yeah. when you're in a kitchen in a mountain cabin, I kept having this problem where I was hearing all the birds and sounds outside. And so finally I went, well, to hell with it. And I went and opened the windows and doors. Right. And just let that sound kind of find its way onto the record. And so I just really thoroughly loved doing this one. It's admittedly a bit dark, <laughs> but I think it's, it's steeped in, in, in hope in the end. Um, and like I said, that some people that I most admire are people that, that d- don't see um, the darkness and the light as being, um, uh, what's the word, antithetical uh, against each other that they right. can live in the same space. And so, yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's, that was after all. Um, right. But that makes a lot of sense to me that you, that you recorded it that way. Cause, cause when you listen to the album, it's very, you know, just raw and like this, you know, just very st- like, I don't want to say straightforward, but it just like, it is what it is. And yeah. you know, it's, uh, I it like, I, I really like that about, about your music, you know? Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, for better or for worse, that's kind of, that's how I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, and I think the, you know, Leonard Cohen and, and, you know, Bob Dylan and Lou Reed, like, I think yeah. the thing that I really love about those musicians is like, they're just raw and honest and it's just like a genuine moment i mean it's truth really you know it's like there's something very very true about all of their the songs you know yeah that, and that's that to me is is the gold standard i i probably would do well to have uh been finding finding a way to lean into being more commercial but it's it's not been what i what i aspire to and, and to me the the Look, not everybody gets to write songs, and and I don't know why I get to, but that's a gift that I'm not squandering. And 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 as you know, um, from your experience as a performer, there's something that feels to me very very sacred about the relationship between me and a song, and then the relationship that people that listen to that song have with it. Right. Um, and and uh, and so to me. It's my job to show up to that with honesty and rawness and being willing to tell you the truth, even when it maybe doesn't make me make me look so great. Right. So. So um, speaking of that, uh, who like who are your biggest musical influences? Uh, it depends on the uh, on the year, of course, but I would say the ones that have stuck that that have been consistent for me. We always said in my marketing materials that, that my music's the intersection of uh, of Bruce Springsteen and James Taylor with Garth Brooks driving traffic, you know. Uh, oh and, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and, and so, so I think that there's a lot of all those guys in there. I think I tend to resonate with storytellers, mm-hmm. um, uh, and then there are ones that are sort of less well known that are huge for me. Patty Griffin is is insanely good. Uh, it's I, it's she's she's such a good songwriter. Um, she's a big one for me. Uh, I'm a big. I, I'll, I'll be honest. When I'm listening to song, what music these days? Um, I I end up listening to a lot of old stuff. A lot of um, everything from from sort of uh, classic jazz to um, to uh, to a, a lot of you know Sam Cooke and and guys like that. I just I'm. I'm moved by things that have that have stood the test of time, um, and and are still so true. Right, so, right. Yeah. So, and, and of course, in my in my early days, I would be derelict enough to say that people. I mean, I, I'm an acoustic guitar player. I'm a folk singer. With, you know, three chords and the truth guy. You got to. I mean, yeah. Indigo, Indigo Girls were a start for me. Uh, they they were 
when I picked up the guitar, the first thing you had to learn was closer to fine. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and so a lot of guy, a lot of folks in that camp, David Wilcox is a great one. Um, Sean Mullins was a big influence. Uh, so, yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, I, I real for me, it's a, it's a pretty wide array, but the consistent theme, if I look at them is, is storytelling. Um, and, uh, yeah. Right. That's cool. So shifting gears a little bit, uh, sure. when did you become a coach slash speaker and how did you fall in love with that? So I, I actually don't coach anymore. Oh, um, you don't? I, okay. I, no, no. I, I, uh, I, I'm working on, I do copywriting now, um, uh, WRIT. Um, uh, and uh, so I, but I did coaching for a minute. And to be honest, the way I got into it is I think the way a lot of artists get into things like that. Um, which is to say, I had to figure out a way to adult a little better. Mm. Um, and and at the time, to be perfectly transparent, when I started coaching, I was working to be on the road a little less because it was very hard on my marriage um, at the time. So um, just because the distance was hard. So mm-hmm. I, I was going to go and become a therapist, and I decided instead to uh, move into coaching because I didn't want to take another $40,000 in student debt. And, and I, and I, and coaching was cool. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the aspect that it was really about helping people see their own power and, and, and help them get out of their own way, if you will, and mm-hmm. into a more authentic path of themselves. I, what I got kept getting hung up on, to be honest, even though I know full on that coaching is not about telling people how to live their lives. Um, I feel like such a hot mess most days that I just didn't feel right. Um, promoting myself as that. So as I said, I, I in recent, it, what I've moved into is copywriting. And, and the reason I moved into copywriting is it's because it's adjacent to the things that I love to do. Um, right. it, it allows me to write. Um, and, and as a, particularly as a, a entrepreneur in that field and as a freelance copywriter, my, my niche is I do purpose-driven copy for your purpose-driven dreams. So it gives me the opportunity to work with creatives and other people that are that have a passion and a fire in their gut and they're not cutting through people aren't finding them it allows me to help to help them kind of optimize the language they use and such and it allows me the opportunity to adult so that my art doesn't have to right um and that's that's a big thing Uh, did you read the book um big magic yes i did yeah so I, I adored that book. I'm actually reading it again right now. Um, yeah, it was a great book. book. Yeah, and, and I, I thought so too. And what I loved that she, in it, in it, in her discussing how to live a creative life, that one of the things she said was that there's a phenomenon that's developed in the last like 40, 50 years here, particularly in, in nations like ours that are a little bit more well off, that you know, you go over to somebody's house and like, this is a great slice of pie. It's not just like, this is a great slice of pie. It's this is a great slice of pie. You should open a business. Mm-hmm. And the problem is that it puts an undue pressure on something that brings you a lot of joy. Um, and one of the things that she was emphasizing was the importance of, of, yes, if you can find a way to make a living doing your craft, do that. But don't put pressure on it in the meantime. And... Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to be doing copywriting because it gives me the opportunity to honor a commitment that I made to my muse several years ago. And I said, you know, I'm done. I'm done yelling at you to pay my bills. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to do that. I'm really hopeful that I'll do that. I've gone through long stretches of my life where I've been blessed to be a full-time touring artist. And it's great. It's, it's miraculous. It was my happy place. But I had developed this really unhealthy relationship with my art too, where I was, you know, begging the songs to come through and so grateful when they got there and just blissed out. And then it, it you know, we just had this kind of lovemaking thing of, <laughs> right. of creating a song. And then as soon as we were done, I was like, pay me, <laughs> you know? And yeah. Uh, so I so said, anyway, so with the copywriting, I'm excited because it gives me the opportunity to, um, to be flexible in my schedule. Mm. Um, and still be able to pursue my craft, um, and even be able to tour with my craft, but uh, but but be supporting myself in the meantime, um, in a more meaningful way, uh, while I'm helping you know things I care about get heard. Right, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I've I've kind of like embraced 
you know, having a day job um, over the past couple years because you're you're right. It's like you know putting the pressure on on your art to you know yeah. make money yeah. for you. It it does kind of um, give you like a certain relationship to it. You know? It does. It does. And and you and I have talked about that uh, before about about this. Because I think this is one of the things that we initially kind of really connected on was just trying to find that sweet spot with with making sure we're not giving up on our dreams, but um, but also taking care of ourselves and you know not being on our parents' couch. So it's it's right. uh, you know if and you've done such a by the way I'm I'm so you you're such an inspiration your your, your journey is so inspiring and I'm so thrilled with how your books are being received and. Oh, thanks. The, the attention you're starting to get, and, and I just, uh, it makes me really happy. It's well deserved. Oh, thank you. No, so, thank you. Um, uh, well, you're a very inspiring person as well. I mean, to many people, um, you've been writing hindsights on the back of your car as well as other people's cars since yeah. 2010. Uh, so tell us about an inspiring experience with hindsights. So I, I will say briefly that hindsights are essentially, I started putting a hinds, a uh, inspirational quote on the back of my car, realized that uh, this is going to, for, for a listener, you're going to be like, what, wait, what? That when you're sitting <laughs> in your car, if you turned around and looked out the back window and you had something written on it, it would be backwards to you. However, when you look in your mirror, it's forwards. So I found that the quotes that I was putting up there were really impacting my, my mindset and how I approached the week. So I would basically started putting a new one up every week that would specifically help me kind of change a narrative that I was working on changing in my head, you know, a new habit or something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the answer to your question is the, the most inspiring, I, I, I've, I've been blessed to do them for some other people as well. And, and, um, uh, but I, but there was I've had a, I had a couple of moments when I started noticing that other people were noticing them because that kind of didn't occur to me that they were, which is kind of bizarre because it was on the outside of my car. Um, oh but, yeah. But it, but it was but it was uh, I remember coming out of a, a day job that I had um, for a while, and I was living in downtown Atlanta, and, that, and the day job was in a place that was sort of on the cusp of kind of a sketchier area, and it was dusk and this guy turns down my street and um and he's in this beat up old pickup truck full of junk like it looked like like something out of i don't know if you remember the show sanford and sons i'm dating myself now but it looks like something <laughs> from, from that from that era and he comes kind of pulling up and he pulls up to me and and, and he's like hey and i got kind of my you know tough up i'm you know i was like yeah what's up you know, and, <laughs> and, and he's like, man, do you know who owns that car? And I was like, yeah, bro, it's my car. And, and, uh, and he's, he says, uh, he, he says, man, I want to shake your hand. I come <laughs> down this street. I come down this street every week to see what's going to be on there. You, you have, you you make my week every week. And I just, I, I so appreciate you. And, and that same street, I had another guy that did the same thing, stopped me. And I went over and he was like, do you know whose car this is? It's mine. He says, he started crying. He said, he said, man, you've saved my life on more than one occasion with those things. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's moving. It ended up being something I put in the book, actually, too. I talked a lot about the hindsights in, oh, uh, cool. in, my, in the, the myth of certainty and other great news when I put that out. So, yeah, I, I remember when when, um, you know, you, you were doing a lot of them at, at Unity North yeah. and there there was like one day that you know i was driving to church and i was late and like there were like 20 cars in the parking lot that had hindsight <laughs> it was yeah, great that was a fun stretch i didn't i it, when i started doing them for other folks it was it was a really fun thing i still do um just when you know when somebody reaches out says hey can you do one i did one for somebody the other day um and and uh it, it's a little different in the COVID era we had to kind of talk it through via text mm -hmm. and phone and then i just showed up and did it without <laughs> without her being there <laughs> so yeah it's been a huge gift a really unexpected one and, and uh, I, it's a, a really fun part of what i how i enter the world too 
Cool. So um, you were talking about the book. Um, and so it came out in 2018. It's it's called The Myth of Certainty and Other Great News. Um, so what was the experience of writing that book like? Really fun. Um, I one of the things that I've, I, I, I'm learning with my creativity, as I say learning, even though I've been doing this for going on 30 years, is, good Lord, I'm old. How did that happen? Um, <laughs> but but I'm, I'm, I'm learning uh, that, that I go through input periods and output periods creatively. And the sooner I can stop sort of freaking out when I'm not writing a lot and instead just go, oh, okay, I guess I'm in an input period, the better off I am. Um, and, uh, anyway, I was on, on, in such a period and I decided I wanted to create some kind of a structure. So I would just keep the, keep the muscles loose, if you will. And so I was writing every day a little bit and finally had this, this ever growing dock on my computer. Um, and, uh, long story short, I, I, I finally, and what I ended up doing was going through and just pulling out all the basic ideas that I thought were interesting just like one line or two. And I put them all on index cards I had a stack of index cards mm -hmm. and one went and over a series of days, I just spread them all out on my bed and kept playing with them um, and rearranging them until I felt like there was a, a, a story emerging um, that that was no nowhere near compete complete because it was just it was more like prompts you know if you've ever done mm -hmm. things it was it was all like a bunch of prompts and i i finally went yeah okay there's something here and i had made an agreement with my muse i had said hey look if you'll be kind enough to visit me i will write whatever it is you want me to write and i will put it in the world as fast as i can freaking put it in the world and i don't care what comes of it um i'm gonna release that need i just want to create it's right. just such a gift to get to create. And um, so what I did, Sarah, is I, at the time I, I, had, I was working at a job that was the last branch before I, I caught, before I hit the ground. Um, it was, I was working at DSW <laughs> of all places. <laughs> and what I do is I get up in the morning and I go to my local library. Um, and I had this chair I like to sit in that overlooked this beautiful tree. And I'd sit there on my computer with my stack of index cards and I just kind of take the next card and I'd write to it and write and write and write until I felt like it was done. And I move on to the next card. Um, and then I uh, did that for months. And when that was finally done, you know, I just, I went through and did as much editing as I could think to do. Looked into publishing for about a half a minute and went, I don't want to spend the money on that right now. Hit print on my printer and called it done. <laughs> <laughs> and put it out there and then a friend of mine came up and who read it and she 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 loved it and uh and offered to uh she said i really want to make sure this gets in the world can can i can i partner up with you and help help put this out there so uh her name's pam nichols and she's a tremendous gift in my life and so we partnered up and um and put it out in the world and you know, i got another friend of mine who's a professional photographer artistic photographer to do the cover for us and Another friend who's a designer actually did the design for the cover. And, and uh, yeah, no, here it is. The myth of certainty, now the great news. And, and now I'm, I'm in the middle of the COVID area, era and I'm living through 2020 and feeling a little chagrined that I have this book telling you to embrace uncertainty. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but finding it to still be true. And uh, it's, uh, so yeah, so it's been, that was an amazing journey and one that continues, by the way. I, 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 I that's been a huge gift because fundamentally what the book is about is you know you and i go we met through unity mm -hmm. and so we're, we're in these faith communities that are getting their own on all the time and always talking about living in the now and being present <laughs> and, but I, to my mind there's just not a lot of folks that have gotten particularly clear about how you do that yeah what does that look like and i don't know that i got clear about that but that's certainly what i was trying to talk about was the reality is there's no such thing as arriving somewhere. You know, one of your books could be a bestseller tomorrow. I could, I could suddenly have a hit song and that's not the end of the story. Right. That's that, that's that moment. And so the, the great stuff doesn't arrive and stay and the awful stuff doesn't arrive and stay. And 
somewhere in there to my mind, I was, there's, that is the answer to, okay, well, then how can I be more present to my life knowing it's all passing through? How does that change my relationship with it? Um, There's a, uh, if I, if I may, I, I know I'm, I'm rambling on. Um, there's a, there's a, a thing I heard Jerry Seinfeld say mm-hmm. um, that was amazing to me. He said that I've come to the conclu- he was in this interview with uh, Trevor Noah. He said I've come to the conclusion that pain is knowledge rushing in to fill a gap. Um, oh, that's cool. I like that. Isn't that cool? And he was yeah. like, you know, you stub your toe, knowledge. There's a table there, and you're not paying attention to where you're going. You know, yeah. and so to my mind. I sort of took that, although I get this, that quote came to me after I wrote the book, but, but I, but I, I took that quote combined with this wisdom of the stoic philosophers that you're not disturbed by things, but by the view you take of them. And in what I hope was a really conversational and not at all as hard to follow as this, what I'm saying right now, or <laughs> I, I, uh, I basically said, okay, well, what if I change my relationship with my life so that the joy and the pain is knowledge rushing you to fill a gap? teaching me how to show up more fully to now and what I care about and what I don't. And whether I get another three beats in my heart or another three, 300,000, how do I want to use those? Right. Um, so there you go. That was the long and the long of that. That's cool. And then I, if you think about, you know, COVID, I mean, one, one of the things that this year has done, I mean, certainty is always an illusion, you know, totally. it, it's always a myth, but, but it's like, we at least have we at least have the illusion yeah. you know and this yeah. year it kind of just we like we don't even have that <laughs> it's totally disabuses of that it, it's if you thought if you were convinced that hey everything's exactly the way it is 2020 obviously well one obviously we have pissed the planet off that's clear <laughs> okay yeah. and and uh, 2020 came along and was like okay i I'm, okay I got to make it clear to you. None of these things in your life are static. It's all dynamic. It's all changing. It can all change overnight. And um, cause it did. Yeah. yeah. It keeps doing it. It keeps doubling down on itself. And I think that uh, I keep saying 2020 is the mother of all teachable moments. Oh, uh, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's the, it's, it's been such a transformational year. In, and in so many ways, to my mind, there's been such beauty um, in the midst of utterly oppressive darkness. Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah, it's it's a really profound time. It's a really profound time. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, so you're the host of Begin by Beginning, which is an uplifting and inspiring podcast. Um, you. But your last episode was in May, so I just wanted to ask wow. you: Do you plan to do any more episodes, or are you kind of done with that? So, uh, I, you know, it was funny because I, uh, you mentioned <clears throat> you were going to ask me that, and I, and I, and I went, yeah, you know what? I haven't done anything with that in a while. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, I think it was, so I got a couple things. One pragmatic, I got a, I got a microphone issue that I got to work out. My, 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 my good condenser mic isn't functioning right. So if anybody out there is a microphone repair person, I sure do need one. Um, <laughs> because I'd rather not have to buy a new one. But, uh, um, I, I, I think with that in particular, particularly frankly, cause it, I just don't have a, a real wide listener base at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just want to come from a place of sharing something when I truly have something to share. Right. And, um, and I didn't know that platforms like you and I are on right now existed where you can do interviews with people, um, and then use them in a podcast. Um, (laughs) so, so, uh, so that there's that. So my podcast has been largely me trying to offer bite-sized bits of, of, um, of hopefully insight that'll, you know, begin by beginning is fundamentally about. Uh, hopefully helping you and I get out of our own way and into our own way to, to little, live a little bit more of our best life. Right oh, now. your, your right podcast now. is great. Well, I remember one time I was driving to work and I was listening to it and I got so caught up in what you were saying that I totally missed my exit and I ended up <laughs> dri- driving like 10 miles too far. <laughs> Uh, that's the best compliment I've received in a while. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm so glad. Sorry about that. 
Um, I, should, I should send you some gas money. Um, that's, that's hilarious. But thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, the answer to your question, I, I, it, it's one of those things I wanted it, sometime in May, and I, and I had another episode that I just didn't air. I, I, um, I kind of lost the thread a little bit. And I think, frankly, to be honest, a big part of it is I am obsessed with the politics of this moment right now. Right. And and that is not something that I've ever used my platform to to delve into. In part on purpose. I I, I have I have I'm I'm a big believer right now. There's lots of ways for us to spout off. Mm-hmm. But that's really egoic. It's 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 more a function of the ego. If I rail, ha ha, I got to speak my piece. Right. You know, but if I want to want to see change, I need to be persuasive. Um, and and seek to listen better and meet people where they are. So anyway, I, I basically, I, the bottom line is I I have not been focused on the kind of things that I was talking about on begin by beginning, and I have not crossed the bridge of kind of figuring out is there a path to be talking about some of the things that are that are on my mind you know right. um, without it just being yet another platform where you're like oh i don't want to hear about this anymore mm-hmm. i get it how we he, I, he's he's a nightmare i got it <laughs> um you know uh so it, it's that's been the but but you your comments on it honestly have inspired me i want to i want to delve back in and get it back up and running it's been really fun to do um, I do voice. I, I have a background as a voiceover actor, and and it's been really fun to kind of bring that experience and my recording experience into this. I imagine it's been fun for you as well to to draw off the things mm-hmm. we both know about audio and use them in this new platform. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. Is the bottom line. Begin by beginnings, not not uh, ended by ending. Um, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's more to come, and I'm I'm also in the process of editing. I recorded an audiobook version of the book. Oh, great. So, That's awesome. Yeah. So in the process, and I'm, I should reach out to you about that because I don't know, I had the first clue about how to go about sort of getting it formatted and in a way that I can put it oh, out. Oh, yeah. Audio. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll um, definitely, uh, you know, help you help you out with that. Um, so, so you wear many hats, you know, songwriter, author, speaker, podcaster, you know. I, I yeah. wear many hats too. Yeah. And, you know, I can never really choose one above the others, it seems. Um, and, you know, I find that sometimes I have to like shift my focus to just being an author or just being a playwright or yeah. a musician or, you know, whatever the moment kind of calls for. So do you find that to be true for you? And then if so, which hat are you kind of more focused on right now? Well, I'll start with the last one first. I would say the hat that I'm most focused on at the moment um, would be the copywriting, mm-hmm. uh, principally because I had started doing that right as this whole pandemic year started, and now I, I'm I'm in the in the risk group, and of course you and I are here in in a state that has not navigated this crisis particularly well, and um, so I'm not in a position where I can leave the house mm-hmm. much. So. Uh, I need to be able to work from home. And so I, I've been really focused on getting that going. The other, I, the, the, I would say on the more creative end of what I do, although that's a very creative process as well, my other focus has been speaking because I've been able to virtually serve some of the communities that I get to speak um, in. And, uh, and so I've been focused, like I'm, I'm doing a talk coming up on uh, October 11th, I think, um, for a church. So I, to, to the first part of your question, it is tricky, right? I'm sure a lot of creatives out there that are listening to this will relate to the challenge of compartmentalizing and sort of siloing right. the different realms of creativity. And, and I think the bigger challenge for me is my creative impulses are a little bit insecure, just as beings, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and a little bit childish sometimes so if if i'm if i'm focusing for instance a lot on speaking stuff some part of my songwriting brain is going to start going ah ah we're never going to write another song you know and (laughs) freaking out so what i what i try to do what i try to do is carve out that space i talked about earlier to for 
for time to just be with my creativity and mm -hmm. let what is calling me to do emerge. Um, and I think what is also really important for me in the time when I am, it is what part of why I'm, I'm trying to pursue this copywriting piece is to create, is to create, what I'm trying to say is it would create as fluid a lifestyle as I can. Mm -hmm. So that when the creative impulse emerges, I can honor it um, and, and really surrender to it. Right. Um, because frankly, that's, that's my greatest joy that, you know, it's one of those sort of better than sex things, you know, when, when, when you actually <laughs> get just, just surrender and you look up and all of a sudden you, you realize you've been working on a song for the last three hours or something and mm -hmm. you didn't realize it, you know? Um, so, yeah. So the, the essence of that is I try to sort of do, do meet somewhere between having a discipline of creating space, um, being having a fluid enough lifestyle that I can surrender to it when I'm able. Um, when I'm not able to do that, I use the crud out of the, I have an iPhone out of the notes app and the voice memo app. I have hundreds and hundreds of voice memos with ideas mm -hmm. in them. And, and then I just try to trust that when I'm, entrenched in one particular creative endeavor that um the others know i have not forsaken them and and uh, and they have not forsaken me um so it's uh, right. that, that's that's what I, I i strive to do anyway it's a process it's you know this this uh, as you as you probably can relate to being a creative feels like a tremendous blessing and also leaves you feeling like you have three heads in a lot of circles yeah and, and um and when you're not actually creating, you just feel like you have three heads, but no value in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a process and it's a, uh, it's a tricky thing to balance, but it's, it's doable. It's doable. Right. So you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but throughout your career, you know, there've been times and you've been a full-time artist and then there's, there have been times that you've had a day job. So what would you say to encourage, um, you know, any artists or creatives who are currently working day jobs and, you know, maybe struggling with finding the balance? Well, you know, I was, I, what I would say is <clears throat> don't bring your, one thing I would say, so there's a do and a don't. I would say a, a don't bring sort of your anger because I think there's always sort of this, this internal anger and frustration and shaking your fist at the world. You know, I have this thing I'm really good at. Why won't you let me do this? I can offer something to the world, you know, or there's yeah. something that I, that I love doing. Damn it. Why don't you pay me for it? Um, don't bring that to your art. Um, it's okay to be frustrated with that, but that is information offering you insight into something you really want to carve out more time for. Right. So then the, the do would be to do that. And and to fall in love with it, and it's. Um, I was reading. I was reading Big Magic this morning, actually. <laughs> um, I have a habit every day. Uh, I start my day with a little bit of reading. I start my day with a little bit of meditation, uh, uh, and, and a number of other things. But just carving out space to start in the right center. And in Big Magic, she was saying, "Have an affair with your, with your craft." And the metaphor, what she was saying with the metaphor was that if you ever notice the people that are having an affair, they have no problem balancing two jobs and kids and, uh, and a partner at home. They still find time to hook up and, uh, right. and, and to make time to be in love with their partner. And even if that's 15 minutes in the stairwell to make out, mm -hmm. uh, they, they do it. And I'm not encouraging people to cheat. Uh, that's not the point of the story. The point is that that if I'm in love with something, I'll make time for it. And right. if that time is only 15 minutes, it's going to be 15 minutes that I treasure. Um, and so for me, the way what that looks like when I was working day job outside of the home was I would keep a guitar in my car, I had a little travel guitar. I'd go to my car at lunch and I'd play my guitar. 
I have a friend who works down at the CDC. She wrote her last record, a really, really great record. Um, her name's Sonia Tetlow, by the way. And uh, she wrote it on her break at lunch. You know, so she's working this really respectable job, doing this really important work, and she go out to her car and write songs. So right. there, there's more time than you think for this yeah. thing that we love if you make the time for it. And if when you have that time, you revel in it and offer gratitude for it rather than being frustrated that you don't have more. Right. I like that. That's good. Um, so you, you also kind of touched on this earlier too, but uh, what are you working on right now? Like mainly just the copywriting stuff or? Uh, the the, the projects wise, I have the copywriting is a big thing um, at the moment. Uh, but that will become less so as I become, you know, get, get my business more up and running on that end. The, the projects in terms of creative projects that I'm working on are A, that talk that I was talking about coming up and B, editing this, um, the audio book. Th those are, those are two big things. I'm excited to get the audio book edited. My, my hope is to get that out this fall. Um, okay, cool. In a way that will be very accessible. So yeah. I'm working on those. And then the other thing I'm working on, honestly, is I'm more focused than ever. The older I get, um, on on just growing in my craft, right? You know, so I'm 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 forever trying. To, I'm I'm a. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm not saying this pejoratively. I'm I mean literally. I, I'm I'm ADD and and uh, I have dyslexia, and the and so the, the combination of those two things has always challenged me a little bit with reading. But nevertheless, I have stacks of books all around me right now as I'm talking to you. I'm forever trying to bring in new material, trying to listen to new things, trying to consume things that can help me grow in my craft. And so that's, I present that as, as something I'm working on because it's growing me. And um, uh, I'm trying to learn jazz chords. You know, you know my music, I'm a folk singer. And, right. and it's, it's at some level, I'm bored with it at this point. I want to be writing in a, our, our writing, I'm sure this is true with the novels you write, you sort of have to learn a language. Mm -hmm. What's the language of a character? What's the language of a song? And so I'm trying to become more multilingual with what I'm filling my head with so that I'm more multilingual, figuratively speaking, in what I'm putting out. Right. So, um, it kind of leads into my next question. So what books or TV shows or movies, plays, music, whatever, are you really into right now? Uh, so COVID has been good for this. <laughs> <laughs> I've had time on my hands. Um, uh, all the news related TV stuff, I'm going to, I'll throw out the window. That's, that's, uh, I watch way too much of that. Um, <laughs> books wise, I'm in the middle of, um, uh, a collection of Mary Oliver poems. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm in the beginning of uh, one of the last books that Leonard Cohen put out. Actually, his his, uh, his son finished it for him, The Flame. Um, I'm reading a book called uh, by A.J. Uh, no, what's it? What's it called? It's called The Unfortunates, and I can't remember who it was. Johnson's the last name of the author. But it was this book from the 1960s that was unbound. And it comes in 27 different parts. Oh, wow. And the only thing, the instructions with it are you have to read the first and the last, but all the others, they encourage you to mix up and read in whatever order you want. Um, and it's fascinating. Um, so I'm reading all those things, uh, television, -wise, television wise and more, to be honest. I always, I'm, I'm crazy ADD with how I read. Uh, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, I'll read like a few pages of something and then like, okay, cool. And move over to something else. And, <laughs> and read that. So I've always got several books going television wise. I, um, am on like my, uh, eighth watching of Mrs. Maisel. Oh yeah. I love that too. Oh my God. Isn't that so good? It's, it's, it's great. It, it looks so beautiful. Um, and the writing is so cool and I love it from a creative perspective that the more, as the show goes on, you get to, have this window into the creative process of creating a comedy routine. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I just love it. So that one I'm obsessed with. Um, I've been, I've been obsessed with this show on Apple TV. This is my joy right now called Ted Lasso. 
um, which is if you're looking for something that's funny, just funny, it's funny. It's good and funny. So um, it's uh, yeah. So those are the those are the ones that I'm, I I could go on and on. I, I I'm a giant film and television buff, and I I watch. If you were in my room right now, what you would be seeing is books and scads of DVDs. Um, I, 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 yes, I said DVDs. Uh, kids, uh, look them up. <laughs> DVDs are these little silver discs. Uh, we have a DVD player up at the cabin, so I'll go up there with boxes of them and watch usually endless um, times through of, uh, of a lot of classic movies. I like a lot of old Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn. And That's that awesome. Kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What can I say? <laughs> so I, ha- I have kind of a big question um, that I ask everyone. Uh, why okay. do you think art is important? Oh, I, wow. That's a great question. And I should have known because <laughs> I've heard you ask other people this question and I didn't think to think this one through at all. But <laughs> I should say, by the way, uh, dear listener, Kisera is kind enough to send you uh, questions and, and I will uh, be be perfectly honest. I, I printed them out with the intention of looking at them, and then immediately said, "Nope, I'm not doing that." I just, <laughs> I, I want to just hear these questions for the first time. So, why do I think art matters? Was that the question? Why do you think art is important? Um, uh, art directs us to all that is magic in the world. Uh, art art directs us to the things that can't be articulated. Right. But it does, whether that's through a paintbrush or a playwright's pen or a songwriter, it's it's being able to it's the it's this this moment when you hear um when you hear something or you feel something or that you didn't know could so fully summarize an inarticulable moment. It's almost like it, 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 art helps us to our souls to articulate and claim um, magic in the world and claim and understand an experience that we otherwise can't understand. Right. Uh, so in that way, to my mind, uh, in many ways, uh, art is is all that matters because in the absence of it, um, we don't have any way of processing the, what truly matters. It's it's what allows us to process love. And there's a songwriter, um, Jamie, I'm going to remember his name, a Nashville songwriter, did this amazing song called That's Why I Wrote Songs. And... And and it's and it's all about how people fall in love to these things, and they fall out of love to these things, and they find a way to to get through, or they sometimes find a way to process through a darkness or cathartic through. Um, you know, uh, I need my rage against the machine just as much as I need my Nat King Cole. It's mm-hmm. it it all helps me to. Um, to notice that the world's not bad, that it's full of magic and that there's magic in the darkness. And there's a reason we listen to, you know, there's a, I often tell people that it's so, Sarah, you'll love this. I think it's so funny, isn't it? The number of songs about feeling um, just so profoundly lonely that are mm-hmm. colossally popular. Yeah. Like the, the, you know, these, these songs of, of deep sense of disconnection and heartbreak that millions upon millions upon millions of us buy. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're, they're, it, it's, it's fundamentally telling us we're not alone, even in the, in, in, in the moment that it's providing a witness that it's okay that you feel alone. Right. Um, and I just, I, it's just magic. It makes me, I'm, I actually almost got a little weepy just talking about all that. I, I, uh. I it's it's our, our, it's magic. It's magic. It's it's to my mind. Um, I, I I'll be very honest with you. There are times for me in recent years, as I've not yet attained sort of the popular and sort of financial levels of success that 
anybody would like to, I would assume, that mm-hmm. I have felt that I've let my craft down sometimes, that right. I was given this opportunity because I couldn't manage the business side of it. I've not served it well. But the reason I felt that ache and that sadness around that sometimes is because it just feels like such a sacred thing. Um, so yeah, that's, I feel some kind of way about art of all forms. Yeah. No, that's a good answer. That's, that's, that's interesting. Everybody, you know, answers that question differently. So it's, I'll bet. It's I'll bet. It's, it's a beautiful question to ask. I, I love that you ask it because you, you don't get into art. Um, you don't get into art because you, you've decided, Hey, this is a fantastic money-making opportunity. Right. <laughs> you get into art because you, well, here's our, you're going to, well, well, this is a great story to get across. I know we're closing in and wrapping up and then you're going to have to edit the crap out of this. It's too <laughs> long. Yeah. But, but, uh, but I, I had the great privilege. I was working backstage at a show back in 1996 at a BB King concert is actually the lineup was, um, Raymond Miles, B.B. King, um, uh, I can't remember now. Van Morrison was in there somewhere. But I had the opportunity after the show to meet B.B. King. Oh, wow. Um, And B.B. is, of course, one of the all-time greats. I had never, God, the way he could play a guitar. Oh, yeah, I I love B.B. King. Oh, my God. I mean, Lucille was uh, another being that was like, Mm -hmm. it, it was like watching a couple dance up there. But anyway, I met him backstage and he was kind of holding court because this was in New Orleans uh, where I was blessed to live for 18 years. And, and he was from like two hours down the road. And so he had family and extended family and there was like going into a barbecue, uh, walking into his, his dressing room. And he was in this big old lazy boy. And I, I came up to him and I took a knee because I'm six foot six and he's in a lazy boy. And, and, uh, I shook his hand and, and I said, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm a, I'm a singer songwriter, Mr. King. And he's like, Oh, I'll tell you something that somebody told me when I was just starting out. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to get this. Oh my God. I'm going to get this advice from the King. Yeah. And then somebody distracted him. And, and, I, and, and he looked away and he got caught up in something. I kept holding his hand. So I'm, I'm on my knee in front of him. I mean, this went on probably a solid 30 seconds and I'm still holding his hand. And, and he finally looks back and looks down at me like, what the hell are you still doing? Me? And, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and I said, Mr. King, you were about to tell me. Um, and, uh, and he said, I said, Oh yeah, well, I don't know. make sure it's what you want to do. Clearly it was not the advice you wanted to give me. And, and I looked at him and I said, Mr. King, I feel like it's what I have to do. And he got really serious in the, one of those moments. And I'm sure you've had these with some of your heroes where they had this ability in the midst of a crowd to just everybody else disappears. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're just with you. He looks me in the eye and he says, he says, then, then you can do it. Then you can do it. And That's man, I, I strutted out of that room. I was like, the king says I can do it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So uh, where can people find you and your work? Well, if they haven't heard enough um, after all this, uh, after me, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you can find me, um, my, my links to my uh, blog post and podcast and music and book and all that at yesbrianperry.com. That is Y-E-S-B-R-I-A-N-P-E-R-Y.com. I'll, I'll um, also link to that in the yeah. show notes. So yeah, and and and, uh, and if you're a copywriter and you go there, don't judge me. I haven't fixed the copy on my artistic site yet. My uh, <laughs> my copywriting <laughs> my copywriting site's dialed in, but my uh, artistic site, uh, I've not not even begun to mess with the copy on. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, well, I hope you yeah. will. I hope they will come say hello. I, I, I'd love to to talk to folks and 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 uh, I. It, I, sounds like you're about to wrap up. I want to tell you, Sarah, I truly have been looking forward to this. Um, I, there's so few opportunities in my life these days to really talk with somebody who's a fellow creative about creativity. And uh, I, yeah. I, Thank, I, thanks for coming on. This was, this was awesome. So awesome. You, you, you're such a gift and, and I love all the ways that you enter the world and continue to, to uh, offer us your craft. So thank you for that. And thank you for doing this. Aw, thanks.
All right, that was so great to talk to Brian. I feel like I really needed that. On the next episode, I'm going to be talking to the creative director of Unity North Atlanta Church, Julie Boniger. She's also a singer and a minister, so very inspirational. Definitely stick around for that, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks for listening to the Find Creative Expression podcast. Please take a moment to leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform. You can find me on Instagram at Sarah E. Crawford or YouTube.com slash Sarah Crawford. Also find me on Patreon at Patreon.com slash Sarah Crawford to support the podcast for just a dollar a month. And that's Sarah, S-A-R-A without an H. I hope you've been inspired today and I'll see you in two weeks for the next podcast.